everyone. I'm Aisha Khader for PCR Online, and today I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Rania Hamami, who is an Associate Professor of Cardiology at the Hedi Shekhar Hospital in Tunisia. Dr. Hamami was the, is the PI of the late-breaking Riverad Multicenter Randomized Trial presented at TCT this year. Welcome, Dr. Hamami, and thank you for speaking with us. Hello, Dr. Aisha. I am really very pleased to uh, participate in this interview and thank you for uh, this kind invitation. You are very welcome. So the RIVERAD trial looked at the prevention of radial artery occlusion with rivaroxaban after transradial coronary procedures. There are lots of ARIO trials looking at different prevention mechanisms, not the least of which is pharmacology. So tell us a bit about the background and rationale of this trial and why you chose to do it. Yeah, I think that radial artery occlusion remains the most frequent complication of transradial access. And uh, once uh, the radial artery is occluded, uh, its future use as an access site for coronary procedure or as conduct for coronary bypass grafting or fistula for hemodialysis will be uh, precluded. And uh, I think that the incidence of ERAO post TRA range it, it's very different between the different studies it ranged between one percent and 33 percent it depends on the timing and the methods of the assessment of uh, radial artery patency i think that uh, now the effect of post procedural the per procedural anticoagulation is well established but we don't know a lot mm -hmm. about uh, the impact of post procedural anticoagulation uh, and that's why we conducted this uh, study to check the impact of rivaroxaban for a short period after TRI procedure. Brilliant. So you used rivaroxaban at a dose of 10 milligrams for seven days, randomized one is to one versus placebo. So, and your primary endpoint was radial artery occlusion at 30 days. Could you tell us the main results of your study? <laughs> Yes, our study is a multi-centric uh, study uh, conducted in Tunisia in five uh, centers, five public centers. During the period between November 2021 and uh, March 2022, we enrolled more than 500 patients, randomized into two groups, the placebo, the control group and the rivaroxaban group. Uh, the main finding that we find that uh, rivaroxaban uh, used at the dose of 10 milligrams for seven days daily will reduce the risk of, uh, of uh, right uh, radial artery occlusion. And we found that uh, the, the incidence in the control group was about 30%, 13%, and the incidence in the rivaroxaban group was uh, 6.5 percent so we reduced the risk of uh, RAO by 50 percent uh, almost 50 percent mm -hmm. and uh, in the other uh, hand we didn't find any risk any extra risk of uh, bleeding uh, the safety and point was also positive for rivaroxaban there was no difference between the two groups regarding uh, the risk of bleeding, mainly uh, the bark two, three, and four bleeding. All the bleeding events were type one, bark one, and uh, it occurred uh, mainly in patients who uh, received uh, free antiplatelet therapy, rivaroxaban plus uh, aspirin plus uh, clopidogrel. Brilliant. So that's a uh very big reduction of radial artery occlusion, despite the mm -hmm. fact that, however, the rates still remain a little higher than what we might think is ideal. So which is, which begs the question uh, about, did you use a patent hemostasis protocol and how would you explain the relatively high radial artery occlusion overall, despite the fact that there was a demonstrated reduction with rivaroxaban? Yes, thank you, Aisha, for this uh, question. Uh, uh, so in our protocol, unfortunately, we do not use uh, uh, patent hemostasis because maybe there was a problem of availability of uh, uh, tier bind all the time. One day we can get uh, 
tear band during another day we cannot get tear band and most of time we use uh, manual compression so we said what we said we will try to mimic the real life condition of our practice we most of time use manual compression and so how about the place the impact of river rock seven in patient treated as every uh, as the daily practice as we do uh, every day uh, maybe the the the, the incidence of uh, radial artery occlusion is uh, high compared to some uh, publication in our uh, in our uh, cohort because we have a lot of uh, many diabetics so we see that the uh, the percentage of uh, diabetes in our study is about 50 percent uh, it's close to 50 percent uh, also we have uh, many patients who had history of uh, transregial uh, approach and uh, for uh, multi, -an multi analysis multi regression analysis we found that the predictors of uh, radial artery occlusion in our study was the female the sex was the history of radial artery uh, procedures and also the current smoking so if we uh, check if we guess for a female uh, who smokes and uh, who has uh, who had a history of a transradial approach the risk of radial artery occlusion is about 50 percent uh, in the other hand rivaroxabon uh, was found as protectors as independent protectors of radial artery occlusion and that's why we think that the finding of our study is very important for in the future if maybe if we guess if we found that our uh, patient has a high risk of radial artery occlusion we can use rivaroxabon uh, for uh, one week at the dose of 10 milligrams daily and it could uh, reduce the risk of fragile artery uh, occlusion by 50 percent. I think that's a very important point, particularly what you said about real world practice, because I mean, in most busy cath labs, I would assume patient hemostasis is not performed. And indeed, in the RESTORE trial, which also looked at rivaroxaban 10 milligrams in a Chinese population, uh, patient hemostasis was not performed. How would you say, compare and contrast your trial with uh, the RESTORE trial that was published earlier this year? Yes. Uh, when we uh, when we start to conduct the study, we have no idea about the RESTORE trial. I think the RESTORE trial was published in March and uh, we, uh, we, we conducted our study uh, between uh, November and March, I think. And uh, the main difference be maybe it's our study is a multi-centric study. Uh, the RESTORE is one single center study. Uh, for the primary endpoint for the RESTORE, the authors chosen to chose to uh, use uh, to define the defined primary artery primary endpoint as the 24 hours radial occlusion and uh, the 20, the 30 days radial artery occlusion was defined as secondary endpoint and uh, the follow was done only uh, for i think uh, 314 patients among uh, 380 patients i think in our study we defined uh, uh, radial artery occlusion at 30 days at the primary primary uh, endpoint. We have almost the same condition. We uh, did not use uh, patent hemostasis or uh, inner compression. It was a real life practice uh, study, both. And uh, that's why the incidence of, uh, of radial artery uh, occlusion was. Uh, very close uh, com when we compare the two studies it was i think about 11 percent in restores and 30 percent in our study yeah thank you and also about the dose how did you choose a dose of 10 milligrams and why seven days we, we know we have capital raptor enrolling at 15 milligrams but i mean you've demonstrated a reduction at 10 milligrams maybe you could elaborate on that 
yes very good question so for the uh, for the for the choice of rivaruktavon first we we chosen rivaruktavon because it's a single intake uh, direct anticoagulant so it will be simple to take for the patient and it will be uh, easy to combine patient to uh, participate in the study and we know for the posology of uh, 10 milligram uh, the patient uh, could uh, could uh, receive the drugs uh, out of the meals or during meals there is no problem and uh, the second point is uh, that uh, we used uh, 10 milligrams of rivaroxavon and seven day uh, it's according to the guidelines maybe uh, of uh, atrial fibrillation uh, for patients who uh, who performed who underwent PCI and uh, received direct uh, anticoagulation uh, anticoagulant for atrial fibrillation we recommend to use seven days of uh, of uh, rivaroxaban or seven days of uh, direct uh, anticoagulant to reduce the risk of bleeding mainly in patients who are uh, at high risk of bleeding so we said in our uh, study we will use the same uh, protocol it will be seven days because we have many patients who underwent pci and uh, to uh, not and we exclude it, of course, patients who are at high bleeding risk, like very old patient or patient with history of uh, with history of bleeding, or patient with uh, anemia, very severe anemia, or uh, thrombocytopenia, or patient who uh, who uh, received puissant uh, antipedo uh, the ticagrelor or Brazil grail. Yeah. Uh, yes. So we yes we try we selected really a patient who are not at high risk and we used rivaroxaban for short uh, period. I don't know maybe with the capital trial we will get uh, new uh, findings and maybe uh, the idea of a new another uh, studies who that will compare the two posology the posology of ten milligrams and the posology of fifteen milligrams will be interesting. To, uh, to give a conclusion about the, uh, the important or the best the best posology to prevent radial artery occlusion. Yes, that's fair enough. And in fact, you did touch upon some of the, the challenges of doing a randomized control trial in settings of lower middle income countries where you said you had to stick to manual compression because there may not be an availability of TR bands, which also, I mean, double up as limitations of the RCT. But perhaps you could elaborate a little more on some of the challenges that you faced and how you overcame them. Thank you, Aisha. This is very important. This is a very interesting question, and I like it, this question, uh, because really it's not very, it's not easy to conduct randomized trial in our life, real life hectic uh, practice. Uh, of course, we have the problem of financement and uh, it was not easy to, uh, to, get, to, to use Rivaroxaban. Uh, Rivaroxaban was, uh, was uh, we get Rivaroxaban from uh, here a, lab a laboratory of uh, drugs, Philadelphia Pharma. And uh, for the placebo, we cannot we use placebo because uh, there is very uh, big procedure to uh, produce placebo in our country. We have to get the author authorization of uh, authority and uh, it could be a long procedure. Uh, the other problems is, uh, of course, the, the consent, the problem of consent in our uh, in our country patients are not uh, are not accustomed to participate in randomized uh, trial and they always refused uh, to participate in uh, the trial and, really uh, yes yes and, and we how have, did you get around that yes it's a long procedure and we have to uh, translate the consent in arabic which is not something which is not easy because sometimes we do not find the technique the the word uh, to explain to the patient the procedures uh, so many many difficulties also 
here uh, the investigators, most of many investigators are the followers who work in the cat labs. We uh, don't have a team who uh, works full time in the field of research. So the follows our follows who works at the same time in the cat lab and in the research and they try to uh, include patients. So it was not very easy to conduct all this uh, uh, don't uh, all the steps of this procedure. And uh, that's why we we try to uh, give uh, our best to succeed uh, to success uh, some uh, some trials like this. I think that's a remarkable effort, particularly given all the challenges that you have had to face. And I mean, I completely understand that given the practice setting that I work in. So congratulations on pulling off this trial and congratulations on your remarkable results as well as the presentation at uh, TCT. I really enjoyed chatting to you. And we can talk all day about this, but we have got to stop at some point. And uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. Yes, thank you. And that wraps up our interview on the River Red Trial. Make sure you log on to PCR Online for other coverage from TCT 2022. Bye.